This is Scott Becker with the Becker Private Equity Podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to be visiting with Balaji Ramadas. And, and Balaji is the, is the brilliant founder of a company called Agility. We're going to talk today about funding a company, bootstrapping a company versus venture capital funding, the pros and cons, the journey that Balaji has been on, some of his thoughts. They've had great success. Uh, Balaji, can you take a moment to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the company? Thank you, Scott. Uh, before I introduce myself, I want to kind of call out the platform uh, that you have created and your team has created. It's serving the community in more ways uh, than I can you know, describe and thank you for. Uh, I see the platform as a knowledge base more than a content collection area. So um, thank you for doing that. My name is Palaji Ramdas, and I'm the uh, CEO, founder, and president of Agility. We are in the space, we are the leaders in the space of building what we call the healthcare operating system, uh, digital operating system. Now, it means many things to many people. Um, a very quick rundown of what it means to us um, is, uh, number one, you know, we use this operating system to level load the capacity and throughput across the system. Um, so if you're a large health system, imagine level loading your community hospital with your major hospital and, and, and your community uh, ambulatory centers with your very busy uh, you know, ambulatory centers in the city. So all that, that falls in the first category. The second category is what we call digital frontline. Um, imagine uh, completely rewiring your huddle process. Hospitals operate with huddles, right? That's just an example of digitizing those things so we can decant the low value work from high value assets. So that's the second part of that. And the last part is uh, care path reorchestration. You know, uh, Scott, I don't know if you know this, but a large health system, uh, academic health system, let's call it, uh, has about 30,000 workflows. And the hypothesis is we need to be very intentional about those things. So that's what we do in Agility. And we help healthcare systems um, focus on what we call moonshot goals. And the example would be a health system that's trying to create 10% additional capacity without adding a single new bed, right? It's a pretty big goal. And you, when you need to achieve those kind of goals, you need the operating system to help you. And another example is hospitals wanting to be profitable at Medicare levels of reimbursement. So those are the, the those are the offerings and that's the kind of goals that we go after. And what I'm proud of, and what you called out is we have built this company with such a big goal and we are completely bootstrapped. Uh, we have not raised around, um, not even friends and family. I don't think we have rich friends and family members, but the idea is we wanted to focus on the front line and, and go where the need is. And I'm here to further talk to you about how this model has evolved and the lessons that we have learned and certainly, you know, hurt ourselves too in certain areas. So thanks for having me. So that's what I want to talk about today is, is this concept of bootstrapping a company. And thank you so much for calling that out. Talk a little bit about that because we see people bootstrap companies and they can stay very close to the core. We see other people bootstrap companies and end up, end up with significant financial harm to them and their families Talk to us about your perspective on this and why it works and how you fund it without doing too much financial harm to the, to the family. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we kind of look at this as having the foundational strategic pillars, right? You need to have pillars by which you can do it. Just because somebody has a great idea of being a bootstrapper, it does not really translate into good outcomes either, right? Um, some of this... Uh, when we started Agility, Scott, in 2016, uh, I'm sure you remember this. You can actually have a good one pager on 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 healthcare, and if you had come from where you know I had come from, which was from Stanford Healthcare, uh, had a couple of colleagues from with Stanford pedigree, you can raise capital. Capital was not the issue in 2016 to 21, let's call it. But in all candor. I should not take credit as a strategy, but I should call out that we were particularly not that good in asking for money. That is the bottom line. But what was interesting is when you have a problem that you can articulate to the customer really, really well, 
And if the customer is able to extract value from the problem statement, then you have a different model. I think that's number one. That's this core pillar to actually hang your hat on to say, am I able to connect to the end user with the problem statement that they are going to say, I need to solve this problem, how can you do this? It has to be that compelling uh, for, for this model to work. And it, so that's the first thing, you know, but immediately after, uh, once you're able to connect in that level, the next three things that we were very focused on to not harm our family or friends, but in the main purpose, not harm our customers that believe in us is we need to have very strong financial discipline. And we call it operating within the means, right? It's, it's, it's instilling this financial discipline and a very unique focus on profitability. And it's not just about being a startup, it's about being a business. You need to be profitable, um, even as a company uh, for us. And which is a yeah, very invaluable trade when the, when the capital landscape is tighter like now. The second piece, Scott, that I wanna talk about is customer-driven growth. You know. When you're using revenue, when you're, when you're bringing in revenue, you are just compelled to make sure that your product market fit is perfect because that's what gets you the predictable, stable revenue for you to grow. And that is the second pillar of building a strong bootstrap company. And the third thing you need to have in this market uh, or, or in this model is a very long-term vision. And that's the advantage and also the disadvantage, right? You know, you can actually look horizons that's much larger than uh, a quarter, certainly, and, and, and even a couple of years out. Uh, you can start looking at what is prioritizing the sustainable growth rather than looking at the short-term um, jobs that come your way. And I have some anecdotal examples on this too. So you can actually prepare yourself for the economic ebbs and flows. And so let's talk about a few things. I, as we've talked, you know, and I, I've done both. I've been involved as a venture capital investor, but I've also started my own company with bootstrapping and did it 30 years ago and had great success with it. But let's talk about some of the pros and cons. Some of the pros of bootstrapping are control. You maintain control. You really dig in and you have to make sure that there's a real product fit. There's often tremendous financial discipline. Those would be some of the pros. Some of the cons are, if you're really trying to build something at scale or any sort of scale at all, you could easily run out of money. Uh, it could be slow going, slow going. And third, and I've seen this a lot in the last few years, people doing real financial harm to their families because they ended up putting more of their net worth into this than they expected and didn't turn out. So talk to us a little bit about some of the pros and cons of bootstrapping, I've listed a few, control, product fit, financial discipline is pros, you know, bigger payday if you hold on and it goes well. Cons are limited dollars to do things, uh, you know, financial harm, could be slow going. What are some of the pros and cons you see to bootstrapping? Yeah, I think I, I will completely agree with your pros and those are easy to point out given the topic that we are talking about, right? It kind of gives you that long-term vision. You can sustain this and grow this and you can actually develop a business that's very customer centric um, rather than anything else, you know? And the let's talk about the cons because that's probably where the interesting meat of the conversation really sits is I do agree that there is always a case that can be made for scale. How do you grow something much faster than it is? You need more resources to do that. Um, that's how everything is set up. So we understand that, but let's re revisit that. The second piece um, on this is financial harm. I want to push back on that a little bit, not because it's a, it's a bad concept, but it's a very important concept. But what I want to say is any business has that financial harm aspect to it, raising capital or not. You know, I kind of call it, it's, it's opium one way or another, right? Own personal money or other people's money. The financial harm is real. And for some people, and people like us, this team, for us, other people's money, our own personal money, it comes with the big burden of being good stewards of the resources. And I want to take that off the table as a con 
because it's not a bootstrapping con per se that we always should be watching out for how we spend our resources. What I'll put in that place is how do we, you know, this, this market is set up where sales cycles are long and we all know about how healthcare operates, sales cycles are long. And we have this larger macro trends of how you know, hospitals become profitable or how they struggle financially. I do see a need for sustaining through those cycles using external capital. So I do see that as a con if you don't have the resources to back into those things. So for me, the two big cons are, can you uh, live through the cycles, the larger macro cycles, and also shorter wave uh, trend cycles in healthcare to get your product fit in place. Um, but if you operate your business, if you're operating your company like a business, which is what I think, it's more than a startup or a VC-backed company, they all have their place. I do think you can get past those cons in a way that you can actually build a sustainable model. Thank you. I would just differ with you on a financial harm issue, only because I've seen enough entrepreneurs with great confidence put a lot of family resources and money into a business and end up with serious financial harm far more than they expected. So I, I would just say, and again, there's counter advice that, which is to be careful on how much you put into it. Yes. It's like going to the table in Vegas to make sure you're only going with X dollars, because if you go with too many dollars, you could put yourself in financial harm. But we've seen enough of that to, to think it's the very real thing with entrepreneurs being very confident. What I love sometimes about the food trap model is still that build businesses where there's cash flow and they're building something bigger early on. I, I love that business model. It's more of a traditional business model than a VC venture model business model. But I think it's very important because it gives you a real clarity as to what customers want early on as well, is aside from just financial discipline too. And, 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 and Balaji, any other thoughts on sort of growing businesses, thoughts on business? Give us some more thoughts from you on what you see as working, not working, advice you'd have for other founders. Yeah, and I, I think I'll give myself the advice too, based on what you're talking about, uh, Scott, is, you know, uh, we all have a lot of opportunities, right? You know, when we, uh, when for people that work in healthcare, the executives that we talk to, that are decision making, when they come to office, I feel like they're, you know, when they pull up their computer or open up their, uh, sit on their desk, they have this big pile of sugar in front of them, right? It's it's all problems that they need to tackle. It's 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 a lot of opportunities. It's a lot of great problems to solve, and very often we either gorge on those things and lose the discipline, or we kind of get overwhelmed by that opportunity and get kind of move on to the next one because it's almost blinding. So um, yeah, yeah, advice and as well as what I see in the market is we need to be very disciplined on the opportunity in front of us and not take our eyes off those opportunities. And again, there is a risk on this too, right? You know, are you picking the right problem? Are you focused on the right things? The market is going to scream at us about large language models. It's going to scream about new opportunities uh, that are exciting. And how do you keep your eyes on the ball? And if you're if you're part of you know an organization that's building new solutions, how do we do that? As well as how does hospital executives that consume and, and get bombarded by new opportunities, how do they maintain that scope uh, is a very critical piece for building a business in general, right? Um, those are the people that see success. And I've seen a lot of executives come and share their success stories in this podcast too. Uh, and one of the things that stands out to me is how they are very uniquely focused on a problem statement and how they were able to build and execute through those, you know, what I call the sugar pile. So that's an advice that I have taken from other people and that's what I give myself and actually uh, want to share it here. With this advice, it, it's, an, it, it's a piece of advice that's not given often enough in today's business world uh, where there are so many different ideas thrown at people, so many different opportunities. And if you don't get good at the core of what you're doing before you start taking yes. on other ideas, you can't really succeed. And so one of the concepts thrown around in culture is that no idea is a bad idea. No question is a bad question. And anybody that's really, truly been an entrepreneur knows that that's a horrendous platitude and a horrendous <laughs> concept. Yes. 
Is, is that it's a fair a statement? Line. Yeah, I, I 100% agree, yes. I mean, the discipline of focus, and here's what we're doing now, and if we get good at this, we'll do more things, is, is so important. I think it's, it's, it's brilliant and true and, and couldn't agree with it more. But as I, anything else you'd like to share with us today? I do. You know, just to add to that point, uh, Scott, I want to kind of throw this term out there that we challenge ourselves with. It's called concept to culture. Anybody can have a concept, right? That's what we're kind of alluding to is we all have concepts. We wake up with ideas. Uh, you talk to one of some of the most significant minds in the country all the time. Um, is we all have ideas and we challenge ourselves in this in, in the screw bootstrap model or anybody that's building a good viable business is can you make that concept into a culture and that's where the real roadblock is and how do you move that from a concept into the culture of people that are using it or are using it and, and kind of become second nature and that's when you've built a good sustaining business model so i agree with your point Thank you so much. I, I want to thank you for joining us again on the Becker Private Equity Podcast. It's always a pleasure to visit with you. Could you take one moment and tell us where people can find out more about you and the company? Yes. Um, you can find more about what we do at agilityhealth.com, E-D-G-I-L-I-T-Y health.com. And um, again, my name is Balaji Ramdas. Um, you can email me at my first name at agility.io. And thank you, Scott, so much for this opportunity. Blasi, it's always a pleasure to visit with you. Thank you so much.